Okay, so the, for the exercise that I had in mind, the, you didn't need to do the integral for the supernovae. These are the our parameters of functional regression data. And the other parameters, they come from here, and here you find the reference. Somebody asked me, where do they come from? So there's a nice web page with you know, all the references on how you get those numbers. Okay, so then the next, you got your um, Martin chain going, and here the uh, example was having only one running. But then how do you know when to stop? At the level of the either side, the plot looks good, but at the level of publishing a paper, you need to know when to stop and whether you have explored properly that the, the, the parameter space. So you need to find a convergence criterion, and that's what I'm going to illustrate, it's just one of them. So it is recommended if you use this convergence criteria, there are others, but this is the one that was going to see implement, that you start four to eight chains at very well separated points. So what you have done now is one. What it's being done is simply, you know, you run the same code, different director if you want, four to eight times on the same data, but starting from very well separated points and let them go. Now this somewhat also protects you for the case where there are different maxima. Because if you only were at one chain, you may get stuck in one maxima, which may be the local one and not the global one. But if you have all eight of them starting from completely different places, chances are that not all of them are going to be stuck in the local maxima. Some of them will be stuck in the global maxima. And then you would realize what's going on when you start comparing different chains. So what this algorithm does, which is what Cosmo and Sida said is put together in Ruby, basically compares uh, the variance within chains to the variance between chains for all the parameters. So for each parameter, it compares the variance within a, ch a chain and the variance across the different chains. And then it's got, it takes a ratio, a suitably weighted ratio, and the requirement, which actually comes out of the hat, is that this number should be smaller than one point or something. And this number by construction cannot be smaller than one, since it's the variance between chains compared to the variance within chains. Where in, in an ideal case, this number should be one, since we are getting a simulation of the posterior, it could never be one, but it should be close enough to one. And that's the criterion. I'm not going to ask you to code this, I'm just going to you know, show you what the algorithm is and give you a flavor of what the concept is behind it. Um, but what I want you to keep in mind is that unconverted chains are just nonsense. So please make sure that when you use your chains for the results, you have applied a convergence and mixing criterion and that is being satisfied. So, Okay, so we say that regardless of your uh, uh, steps, of your uh, uh, proposal distribution, eventually you'll get there. So eventually you will get there. But the point is that you don't want to get there eventually, you want to get there in the smallest amount of time as possible. So this number required doesn't depend on the number of steps we have in, in our chain. So if you start the chains from very separated points, no. So for some model you may require less step, for some other model you may require many more. For example, for a out of the box simple lambda flat lambda C N with Planck data, you require many less points than an open model with massive neutrinos or with effective number of neutrino species or with with that. Yeah, but the coherence metric estimation depends on the error. Yeah. The error in the coherence network is situation fit with one over square root of n. So there is no so th there is no requirement about this value of n at some point just to say this or no so you, you have also the, 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 the sorry? So the question is 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 there a minimum requirement of the length of the chain? 
beyond this requirement. And I've never seen starting eight chains of very well separated points that by chance you get something as small as this and you still have nonsense. I've never seen that. I mean, in principle, you could imagine that if you have a short chain, so maybe two of them, by chance, you get something like this, and then given enough time, they go out of convergence. So, uh, you have also another requirement, that you want to produce nice plots. <laughs> and with three points, you are not going to produce nice plots. So to produce nice plots, you need the order of thousands of points anyway, and then by that time, this is always on this way, I've never seen uh, anything like that happen. But in principle it could, it's just I couldn't say. You say that this would be more than one by construction? Yes. But it's required to be less than one point for three? Yes. But less is how uh, less is one, like zero point five? So it, 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 it cannot go below one by construction, okay, right? It can, it's always greater than one by construction. But you would start a chain, you would get value of 50. Then the chain is run a little bit and you get value of 2. Then you get value of 0.1. And then it, it may stay at around 0.1 for a very long time and you start getting impatient. Then eventually something happened and we're going to see what something happened is and eventually we'll move around that. So it should be between 1 and 1.3? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in some code you may find, at least you know, some code that Sarananta were coming out a few years ago, that it was going below 1, but it was going below 1 just because it wasn't computed at enough accuracy to actually say that it was 1.00 or something. Okay, so unconverged chains are just nonsense. I think we'll all agree with that. So, I'm, I'm sure you know that, uh, if you have heard about cosmological degenerates. In the cosmic background, somebody but joking, we say everything is degenerate with everything else. It is because the parameters we are interested in are not the parameters that those data are constrained. So, for example, we are constrained extremely well the position of the first peak, but the position of the first peak doesn't correspond directly to H0, does it correspond to omega matter, does it correspond to curvature, it corresponds to a combination of all this. And so as a result, you have what are called cosmological degeneracies. And a typical example, for example, it's omega from the cosmic wave background, the omega full matter versus Hubble. Very nice banana. Now, these kind of bananas are very, very hard for MCMC to explore. Because you will want the step size, which is comparable with the thin size of this banana. But then you're going to explore very well this direction, but it's going to take you forever to explore it in this direction. And this is just in two dimensions. Imagine in six or ten dimensions, you have this sort of multidimensional vegetables. <laughs> right? And that you don't really know how they look. But you know, you are going to give problem to, to your to your gene. So, if you are smart enough and you know what's the physics behind it, you can simply reparameterize. So, one of the first uh, suggestion exactly for dealing with these degeneracies was to say, "Aha!" Uh -huh. But I know that what I measure very well is something that has got to do with the position of the first spin. So, let me just change my parameters, and instead of stepping around parameter spaces, omega matter, omega lantern, and h naught, I stepped on parameter space using a different set of parameters. And the key parameter was to use, instead of h, use this ratio of quantities, which is you know, the, the sound horizon and the coupling divided by the distance to the which is exactly what the CMB meant. And so that reduces this banana to something round, some round ellipse, but it's not very squeezed ellipse. And this is much, much easier to do. So by doing this change of parameters, you speed up your convergence by orders of magnitude. 
Before it was taking you 10 days, now it takes you less than a day. Okay. But you need to know the physics and you need to know what's going on. And you need to know how to do this operation, which is obviously highly nonlinear. And here there are integrals of complicated. What's the y-axis in here? So here is omega called the h square, and here is this quantity. So, so we went from omega called versus h naught to omega called the h square versus this new variable. So this is the sound horizon of decoupling, and this is the angular size distance to decoupling. So, so remember, the CMB is doing a, a triangle. You have a standard ruler out there, which is the, the sound horizon up the coupling. And then you see it from here. And that's how we say the CMB measures well the geometry. It doesn't measure exactly the geometry, but it gives you a very big triangle of which you know very well one side. And you can measure the angle. So that's what this is exploring. So if you don't know the physics, instead of uh, guessing, there's another approach, which is automatic and which is actually implemented in Cosmo MC. So what it does is something a little bit smarter. You get the chains running for a little while. And once you have sampled the parameter space, out of that sample computes the covariance among the parameters. That's not the covariance of the data, which you need to have to do the likelihood. It's the covariance of the parameter. At this point, this is going to be something that is not diagonal. If it's not diagonal, it means that the parameters are correlated. But you can do a matrix operation, like a rotation, to diagonalize it, and then use the new eigenvectors as the parameters you want to step on. So find the axis of this multidimensional ellipsis, perform a rotation, and if you want also a rescaling to obtain azimutally symmetric contours, and then go on. This improves the efficiency by factors of 10 again. Efficiency means how fast you get the convergence. And this is still a linear operation. Why do I stress this? For two reasons. The first reason is because if you throw this problem at this, what this would do, it would find the maximum here and then will approximate this banana with an ellipse. So it's going to obviously lose the space, but it's going to do so much better than actually using something that's completely simple. So it can't do as good as this, but it can get close. But of course, you do it blindly, you didn't have to know this. Now I have a question for you. When you implemented your uh, Metropolis hosting, you always dealt with the library. Right? You never called in the prior anywhere. And yet I keep telling you that you get a sample of the posterior. So something is missing. Where is the prior? Any guess? Somebody here knows the answer, but is not allowed to tell it to anybody else. I want you to think. Sorry? Which random number generation? There are two. There are two of them, right? There is one that is the dice you throw when you have the two likelihood. One is less than the other, and you have to decide whether to accept or not that one. And then there is another random number generator which you throw when you decide to take a random step. The you think it's the, the, the take a random step. The, exactly. the prior is hidden in there. I could take a random step in omega matter, I could take a random step in omega lambda, I could take a random step in H naught, or I could step in that theta quantity. I could use omega matter H square, or I could use omega matter H, omega cold. You have several different choices. So when you do this linear operation, you are still not really changing your primes. But when you do a non-linear operation, you do change your primes. 
Okay, good. So now you have all these points in this file, which, by the way, you can save in several different ways. So in your exercise, use some of the points were repeated, right? So each each point in parameter space had a weight of one, but some of them were repeated. Now, if you were doing that, when well, the chains are very, very long, then the files will get the ginormous. So one way to compress the file is simply to say, oh well, if you were stuck at that point for 10 steps, you don't need to repeat all the you know, 100 columns 10 times. You just put a little 10 in front and then keep on going. So this way you really compress your file. And so, so, so in some cases you will have a weight in front of each point in parameter space and you will know how long the chain was done. The density of point in parameter space gives you the posterior distribution. But this density will need to be weighted by how many times you got stuck at each location. To obtain the marginalized distribution, just project, as it was saying before. Now, we don't have multidimensional integral. And to obtain the confidence interval, you have to integrate the likelihood surface. Why do I say likelihood in in the quote? Is it a likelihood? Is it? No, it's a posterior, right? So you are integrating the posterior, except that the, at least 50% of the papers that I see, they still call it likelihood. So that's why I put the likelihood in quote. It's really a positive. And then compute, for example, where 86.3% of the points or weights are. So here is a way to compress it. Now, let's say you want to add to the analysis another data set. That does not require extra parameters. What do you do? You don't have to run a new chain or add in that parameter and recompute. What you can simply do, you can say, well, now this weight, I just renormalize it by the weight the other uh, data set would have given me for that point in parameter space. And so you renormalize the weight by the likelihood of the new data set. And that makes everything so much faster. So you don't need to rerun CMD fast the current class of one. However, you may want to keep in mind this is called important sampling or post processing. You may want to keep in mind that if the new data set is not consistent with the old one, I cannot guarantee what you're gonna get. Because by construction, uh, if you have a finite number of points, for example the posterior, most of the points are going to be within the one sigma region, 68% of them, right? The, the, what is called one sigma region is not one sigma region, it's 68 so, you know, 95 something percent of the points are going to be within the 95%, etc. So if you add another data set which wants your parameters to be outside the 95% confidence region, means that you have 5% of the points to play with. And we've seen how rapid the plot looks like when you have very few points. Change. So you've got to be careful. So, you said the prior was on the random number generation and in the second step, right? So, it's, it's not in the random number generation, but how you use that random number generator to step. Okay, but in, in theory, those random numbers are not random, okay? And the problem is, if you, if you define one seed, and then you will get the same answer every time, but if you change it, you will get the different, the different answer every time. So. So the problem is, are we losing some information with the, the that random generation number step? Because then you could watch the code in the Python library and you'll see how they create the, the, 
the, the numbers, it will throw it. I mean, because they're not random, are we losing some information there? Okay, so the question is, uh, I told you to take a random step, but if the chain is very long, nobody guarantees me that my random number generator is going to really be random with a very long sequence. Is that, is that your, yeah. your problem? So, well, first of all, well, even when you start with different point in parameter space, you want a different chain to reinitialize the random number generator, right? That's always a good thing to do. And the other thing, you got to hope that your number, random number generator periodicity it's longer than the length of your chain. Okay, but that will change by language also because the, the, the code for Python is different from, from, from Fortran and from everything. So, so you need a good random number generator. Okay. With a bad random number generator, you're going to get something that is not a bad chain, which doesn't mean that you can't do so some sort of inference from that, there is some tolerance because it's anyway an approximation to the posterior. But uh, yes. So the same the other thing is, you know, you can't change the way you step because otherwise you then you don't have strictly a mark of chain. Now, in practice, what I've seen that you can tell uh, Cosmo MC to keep updating the covariance matrix constantly. And what you end up with is something that is indistinguishable of what you will get if you didn't continuously update the covariance matrix. Why? Because at some point the updates are so small that effectively it doesn't matter. You don't see the difference because anyway you have an approximation to the studio. But in principle, if you want to be poorest, that will not be Yes. Alan wants to go. Or I don't want to ask a question when before we go, or anybody wants to ask a question. So let me yes, go. In fact, I have a question about my new food uh, information. So between two parameters for the banana. Mm -hmm. uh, one is how do you how do you how do you, how do you use a prior when you do that? So you combine the priors of the two, the two parameters. When you do that. And the second one is, can we do something like a PCA before with the parameters and after apply the MCMC for the repetition uh, MCMC convergence? Okay, so uh, the first question, let me see if I understand, is when you do yeah. this, uh, now you have, for example, you may decide you have a, a uniform prior to this quantity, and a uniform prior on this other quantity, which means that you did not have any more uniform prior on H and uniform prior So that's how sometimes this plot come out of, you know, let's put only the prior and see what happens. <laughs> yes, that's exactly. And the second question... The second one was, because we can see here, the prime to visit is, is, uh, is the relation between the, those variables. So if there is uh, a method in general. Ah, see if there is a generic method that will allow you to know a priori where problems like this happen if you don't know the physics. Okay, so this will need what we will do tomorrow. <laughs> so there is one way to compute what is called the Fisher matrix. Where you say, so basically the idea is, well, you know, let me just say that I don't have the Planck data yet, but I have some fake data that looks like the Planck data which I can produce ahead of the experiment. I have a fast way to do that, it doesn't involve Monte Carlo, and the fast way we are gonna discuss it tomorrow, and very approximate. But approximately, it's gonna tell me how around the fiducia, this parameter space look like. And then I can use that as information for this step before I start running. In reality, what, uh, what uh, the, the Planck people probably did was use the WMAP, covariance matrix extracted from the WMAP chains before they started running the Planck chains, and then use their own covariance then to allow uh, they to use a previous experiment. That's the, that's the other option. Which is 
So it, 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 it doesn't matter, eventually you will get there. <laughs> So I think Gaussian gets it better. Uh, although I haven't compared head to head with a fixed step and a Gaussian step. A Gaussian gets better. So I don't know how by how much because I haven't compared. Okay, if there are no other questions.